I'm wondering, one is how do you ensure, it's actually a two-part question, one, how do you ensure that your projects are actually fully representative? So that, you know, when I look at the city of Melbourne, how do you ensure that you really, you have the right representation there and you're comfortable with that? I'd be curious also maybe reflexively with your own organization, do you feel that you actually covered all the right people? Because you didn't have 10,000 people in that circle. Um, so that's one part. And then the second part is um, the sustained successfulness of these projects. Because one of my questions has always been, I've, I've participated in events like these, there's been great sort of the moment is euphoric. It's the follow-up afterwards that I'm curious in. Have you, have you actually tracked that and has, how has that actually progressed? All right, Thank great. You. Thanks for those questions. So to the first one about representation. Um, no, I wouldn't say that, there, um, that open space engagements are, um, are in any way guaranteed to be representative in a statistical sense. Um, the, the key criterion, and I mean, th there's some other interesting thoughts been expressed in the presentations we've just heard um, around what constitutes, um, or what, are the, what are the filters or processes by which you get the right people into the room, whether it be a physical room or otherwise. Um, with open space, it's the, um, the, the key thing is invitation which is essentially saying to people, look, if this is a conversation you want to be part of, then please come along. And if you are prepared to take a, uh, responsibility for, um, for not just holding a session about your topic of passion, but you know, carrying it through, recording it, and, and ensuring that it's part of what's disseminated, then you know, you're, you're duly empowered to do that. Um, the degree of representativeness of any particular open space is therefore going to depend on who the kind of, who the bigger pool is from which you're drawing those invitational elements. So with um, the City of Melbourne project, ComConnect, which you referred to, um, that, was, uh, that was open to anyone who wanted to come. Now, we sent out invitations in the first instance to people who we knew would be interested in knowing that it was going to happen, you know, a kind of... Um, Digirati in our networks, but it was a publicly funded event. It was free. It was ticketed because um, we could only uh, we could only accommodate 150 people for fire safety and you know other and catering reasons. Um, but it's it's also about um, it's also about. Uh, in a, well, I mean, it, it's, it's about the phase of the process at which you apply a tool like this. So this was meant to get a conversation off the mark that previously was not happening in any formal or visible way. I mean, yes, of course, there are, there are hundreds, if not thousands of people in the city of Melbourne, you know, a city of more, four million people who have um, some degree of, of interest in its digital future. Um, but, uh, but in terms of getting a process underway, representativeness in a statistical sense is not the most important thing. Um, pulling people out of the woodwork who care enough about it to, you know, to want to have the conversation and to initiate some projects is the most important thing. So, yeah, you don't necessarily get that, in a, um, but, but that is probably not the most, probably not the thing you're aiming for, at least at the outset. Um, in relation to the other, uh, the, the other example you gave, yeah, I mean, so Arab's a company of 10,000 employees uh, within the region. This was a regional forum. Um, th that pool was 1,500. And this was actually, this was invitational in a more um, kind of circumscribed sense uh, that it was, the invitations went out to kind of the, to whatever it was. I mean, 120 people ended up coming, but uh, to the sort of top echelon of, um, of management and leadership. Um, and the diversity criterion in that case is, uh, of the five things that I mentioned, kind of composing a, a successful open space process, um, I think that, is, that's, that was probably the most challenged of the five um, because it was, a, it was a pretty big step for us to move into that um, domain at all. Uh, let alone to kind of throw the doors open, which I would happily, which I advocated and would happily see, you know, occur in a, in a future iteration. Throw the doors open to other people from across the organisation. So I guess you don't get it to begin with, but doing it at all 
is significant in a public sector context as well as a corporate one. Um, your other question had to do with uh, follow through. And, um, and I think in a way what I said about representation begins to speak to that, which is that if you um, enable and empower people to find each other and to get underway with the things that they want to see happen, the responsibility really rests with them and the opportunity really rests with them to, to take things forward. I also think, and this might sound like a dodge, but I actually think in a lot of cases um, this, is, this is kind of an important rejoinder to that, hang on, what are the outcomes um, question, which is, is legitimate, but I think in some ways can, can be applied in a, mis, in a misguided fashion, which is that when you're talking about the, um, the about uh, a society at large or an organization at large, you know, and kind of dealing with these big strategic or policy questions, no single intervention is going to solve it once and for all. And it's, it's a pretty, um, it's sort of a um, disappointingly common um, trope to sort of expect somehow that, that any given event needs to put a full stop at the end of the, of the sentence and sort of be able to declare we did this and this and this. I think um, the significance of an open space process has to do more with contributing to an, a, a mental ecology in which certain types of thoughts are thinkable, certain types of conversations can be had that otherwise wouldn't be had. And while it doesn't um, uh, in and of itself, certainly not, you know, just using, using the process doesn't, um, you know, guarantee particular product-like results, if used appropriately and with the right kind of Duration, as I said, you know, a three-day event is a totally different beast from a one-day event. Um, you can get closer to to those sorts of of outcomes, but I, but I, but I do kind of like to underline because it is part of the part of the paradigm shift, overused term, but applies here. I think part of the paradigm shift that we're sh we're talking about here is moving from a, a kind of a very choreographed, supposedly outcome-oriented, convergent process to actually accepting open-endedness and the fact that things can iterate and you know. Um, proceed towards outcomes in a more meandering fashion, but one that's actually driven by people. Okay, long answer, but I hope that answers your questions. Um, I, there were a lot of interesting points raised this morning, and I was just wondering if um, the panel here can mention, like, because um, um, it's kind of a swing back from yesterday. Yesterday was a bit of more optimistic, and then now we're looking at, wait, hey, there are problems that we have to deal with. So my question is like, um, are, you, are, we, are we aware of any efforts by government uh, entities towards uh, open data or crowdsourcing that's actually going in the right direction, that you think is actually going in the right direction? Because I, having, I'm, I'm a journalist and I also work with the tech guys, and I'm aware that um, for certain things, it's like you, you need to phase. So there's phase one, phase two, and various iterations of something. So the question is, um, uh, what's token that is actually just that token? And then what seems to be um, uh, something, an initiative that's going in the right direction? And there. So I guess I'll... Uh I'll start to address that since I was one of the more, at least apparently, pessimistic ones. Um, <laughs> so a big part of why I was talking about problems is because this is an ongoing conversation and this is a set of challenges. This is not to say that I'm not profoundly hopeful. I mean, you know, this is like saying, well, there's some things that you need to think about when you're, demi when you're designing the government of a democratic country. Like, yeah, some of the, you know, there might be massive civil wars. That would be bad. You should do things to avoid them. Um, you know, I think that the, uh, that the liquid feedback process or the liquid feedback tool and liquid democracy in general and this kind of um, uh, delegatory democracy concept, these kinds of very, very aggressively participatory structures are actually amazingly promising. I mean, it's the... It's the thing that I've seen that gives me some hope for democracy not being a joke for the rest of this century. Um, yeah, there are some challenges, but they're, they're being worked on. So I would definitely encourage taking a look at that. That's definitely on the more radical end of, of what crowdsourcing can mean, but I don't think that that's a problem. I think that that's, that's a really good example of where that can go. Um, you know, where that is starting to go at um, local and even uh, now national level politics. 
I would say a couple of things. Uh, there was a, a festival here called Up Singapore that was um, in la late last fall, I think, that had some really interesting open data that was then put into a hackathon kind of like weekend. I would definitely have a look at that. Um, we did an open IDEO challenge here with the NEA um, that was uh, quite well, well received and is taking some of those things forward. Uh, some of the things out of the CIO office in the U.S. are, are pretty interesting. I think there are, you know, there are there are examples of of, of openness and and I think not only great intent but but good uh, good uh, execution that are happening. Um, but but I think that it's also I think that we're all actually three of us quite optimistic in presentation and the four of us in in, in temperament. But I think it's really really important to have that that viewpoint because. You know, there are, there are places where there are real things at stake. You know, we don't iterate on people's pension systems, <laughs> right? Like, there are things that you can, you can, you can take out an approach like this toward, and there are things that you, you, you shouldn't, right? Well, I don't think it's true that we couldn't iterate on people's pension systems. I think that we just need to be aware of what we're doing and, you know, design in mechanisms to deal with things when we screw up, yeah. you know. There's no reason why you can't do that, yeah. you know. Actually, on, on that reminds me to mention uh, a new entity that's just been launched through the Institute for the Future um, over in Palo Alto, which uh, about, um, well, a month ago, I guess, they launched a new project called the Governance Futures Lab, which is looking at the ways in, and, and the, the launch event was called the Reconstitutional Convention. So, you know, it kind of had an American flavor for obvious reasons, that's where it was located, but it was, it was a very international conversation because the need to, um, to, to look at reinventing um, and replacing and redesigning, or at least revisiting some of these pillars of how we uh, organize ourselves, both government and governance more broadly, uh, is becoming apparent to everybody. I, I, sorry. I don't particularly think that the tone was actually pessimistic in a sense. I think that the tone was optimistic, but rather that we have to, moving forward, rethink how we're doing things so that we can do it better. I would love to hear you guys counter each other's arguments from the presentations. <laughs> that would be awesome because Eleanor was giving a few critical points and then Stuart and Jen, you were quite a bit more optimistic and, and I think you still hear also the, the pro potential problems. Uh, so, can you fight? <laughs> I, I think that we actually all, uh, I mean the panel was designed this way, right, by NOAA to have kind of some, some thesis and then antithesis and then some synthesis. And I think that we all are, are, are again, optimistic by temperament, but realistic by, by trade or by practice. So, I mean, we could fight, but we'd be fighting with ourselves, <laughs> inside and, and across, right? right. Like, uh, and I think that, you know, the, 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 the presentations were representative of a spectrum of optimism and hope and, and, uh, and divergence, right, in, in how we use these things to, to get new ideas, and also a recognition of some of the dangers and, and the, the foibles of implementation along the way. It's not called crowd doing, right? It's called crowdsourcing. Um, and I think there's a, there's a reason for that uh, in terms of kind of what we're trying to, what you try to get to, I think. I want to answer that. Um, the, uh, my mentor, Jim Dater, who's a professor of uh, political science, actually, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, set up a, a futures um, research institute there 40 years ago, still, still running it. Um, he says, should I be optimistic or pessimistic about the future? The answer is, Neither. I should be aware and active. Um, and so I think in a way the optimism, pessimism thing is a little bit beside the point. Um, and the, the conversation that we're all in here is sort of about awareness and activity and, and shaping things in, in whatever way we can. I actually agreed with everything I heard uh, Ella say. So um, sorry to disappoint, you won't get any fight from me there. I guess one modification that I would make or kind of a point just worth teasing out, I know we have very little time here, but the criteria for um, making uh, the wisdom of crowds work, I think, um, is one point where we need to be clear about whether we're talking about, you know, the weight of cows or the location of, you know, um, of a sunken ship, things that actually have answers, versus... Um, prediction markets which are about a, you know, a fundamentally different ontology. Um, and uh, that, is a, that is a totally different question 
um, whether a group can can collectively predict how an election is going to turn out, or you know, a, a, um, the product of a complex adaptive system um, versus a knowable but just difficult, you know, difficult to for a single brain to know. They are they're actually totally different things, and I think we it, we conflate them at our peril. Um. Well, yeah, just, just just since you want to see a fight. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I, I agree with uh, Stuart on that point. Is that there is no knowable, no uh, unknown thing that we can actually know at this point. We know that there are unknown unknowns, and that's why we actually have crowdsourcing, because through crowdsourcing, we are trying to unearth the unknown unknowns that we might not know, but that might exist out there. So, which is the concept underlying distributed cognition, anyways. But um, I, I agree with you in the sense that in a complex adaptive system, there is no answer to one thing. You're dealing with culture, there is no answer. But uh, what we are trying to actually put across is that there are groups of people that can give you more informed opinions than just, say, mass crowdsourcing. Yeah. Did you want to weigh in on that at all, Ella? I mean, I think it depends what what the question you're trying to answer is. Right. You know, there are, you know, yes, if you have an engineering problem and you're trying to come up with novel solutions to the engineering problem, you're probably more likely to get answers to it for engineers. However, you know, if you have a political problem, um, I think if nothing else, if you're, if you're dealing with politics, if you're dealing with governance, um, I would argue strongly that it is ethically inappropriate to only consult as experts on that problem if you believe in democracy as a fundamental good. And I would also argue that when you're talking about questions of social structuring or you know systems that people interact with, anyone who interacts with those systems, regardless of the capacity that they interact with it, is as likely to have an answer. 